Excellent. Hi, my name is Adam Fish. I'm a PhD candidate in anthropology at UCLA with a focus on media studies. And this proposal, this project, is about what can progressive television news teach us about culture and the transformation of the public sphere. So I'm trained in anthropology and communication. My methods include ethnography, which is long-term participant observation with the subjects I'm studying, getting to know their culture, customs, etc. And most of my research for the last decade has dealt with understanding how culture, power, and technology shape communication, and also how culture, power, and technology shape something we call the public sphere, this space between the market and the government, where we so collectively decide what our future may be. And so these projects have spanned the world. I've worked in Kyrgyzstan to study revolutionary bloggers and how they use the internet to, to uh, amass people for support of, of reformation. I studied social entrepreneurs and how they've used the internet to find micro work for the developing world. I've also worked with Native Americans and, and researched how they use social media to collectively understand their issues of sovereignty and heritage. With my most present work, I've wanted to take on the West and the power that the Western media has over the world. And so, as an ethnographer, I began by surveying the landscape to understand what was out there and where I could possibly find a location where I could do some of this field work. And I looked into traditional cable, such as CNN, interviewed several people there. I looked into progressive, left-leaning uh, television news networks like Free Speech TV, Current TV, Democracy Now. I also looked into internet video networks like YouTube and Blip, because this was this era of internet television convergence. And I thought that would be a fruitful space to look at how transformations are occurring. I also looked into the insurgent foreign TV networks like Al Jazeera and Russia Today, which are foreign supported but are, but are gaining carriage in U.S. markets on cable and satellite and, of course, on the Internet. And I wanted to round it out by looking into video media activistic organizations like Witness, who gives cameras to um, people in war-torn contexts, conflict conflicts conflict contexts, and also Free Press, which is a uh, media reform organization that uh, looks to sort of keep media free and publicly available. So of all these organizations, I tried my best to get access and uh, was, uh, you know, I was, I, was, I was in the loop with CNN for months uh, in, their, in their HR, their human resources department, their legal department, couldn't quite get access there. The people that actually gave me the access that I needed for long-term um, investigation into their into the the, the the background stories, the backstage existence was free speech and current TV. So this project that I, I'm going to tell you about is specifically focused on the work I did with current TV, which was started by Al Gore in 2005. But in order to get access, I needed to really make some documentaries for them and actually begin to work with them and and so that's what I did and so I I made uh, 16 television documentaries between 2007 and 2009 for current TV I I went to Belfast and Nicosia Cyprus and East Jerusalem and reported on divided cities I worked with Native Americans to understand how they were how they were um, capitalizing on their their sacred lands for touristic um, revenue. Uh, I looked into Kyrgyzstan revolutions, um, creationistic museums, um, Buddhist sacred lands, and how they were being overrun by Hindus and the and the the debates surrounding that that those instances. So I produced these sixteen television documentaries. In the process, I got to know Current pretty well, and I was able to understand that. Their seed funding comes from Democratic Party fundraisers and Silicon Valley angel investors and Hollywood moguls. But they are a totally legitimate cable television satellite network. They're on Direct, Dish, Comcast, Time Warner, Sky UK. 
They're in the U.S., U.K., Ireland, South African, and Italian markets. At least they were in the Italian markets, and markets until News Corp, Rupert Murdoch, kicked them off. And so when Al Gore had this original vision for current TV, he wanted it to be an interactive, youth-driven, uh, participatory cable network. Right? So before we hear what Al has to say, let's get a little bit less ridiculous photo of him. Uh, even though I love this one, the tipper tattoo as he's throwing up the signs, I think it's just totally hip. But anyways, so here's Al explaining Current TV. And while he was devising Current TV in 2005, he was also writing this book called The Assault on Reason. And in this book, he puts forth this argument that the American experiment in democracy is becoming somewhat of a failure because of the dumbing down of the population. That reason, logic, has been um, assaulted. Um, and, and the ca cases he, he provides are the war in Iraq uh, and how we were led into that by, by false evidence and how the, the global warming crisis is being sort of pasted over by pseudoscience. And so in this book, The Assault on Reason, Al also outlines how to save this American democracy. And it's going to require something like current TV. And so here's a poll quote in which he's describing current TV. He says, democracy depends upon the openness, reliability, appropriateness, responsiveness, and two-way nature of the communication environment, right? So Al is outlining this idea that television shouldn't just be this one-way, these pundits speaking down to people, but it should be an interactive experience from the audience to the producers, okay? And this experiment that Al had of two-way communication at Current TV was a short bit of time. It only lasted from 2005 to maybe 2009. After that came what I'm calling the Hollywood model, which is where he hires television pundits to tell us what we should probably know, apparently. Uh, and he hires Keith Olbermann and Jake Uger. So a lot of this project that I'm about to tell you about is is trying to understand what it means when an, an open, pro-democracy corporate project transforms into a more closed, more professionalized, more pundit-based uh, television news operation. So this is where the project is coming out of. And so here is Jank Uger, um, one of the people that got hired as current transformed into this more professional modality. And you can hear in this clip that I'm going to play for you, Jank describing the discourse of current TV. So let's hear what Jank has to say. Hi, it's Jank of the Young Turks, and we've got an exciting new announcement for you guys. We're coming to television, and I've got a new boss. I think you're going to like this boss. Look at this. Welcome to Current TV, Jank. Joel Hyde and I are so excited to have you. We want you to keep on speaking truth to power without fear or favor. You're on a truly independent network now. That's why I'm here. I love it. I want to be independent, aggressive, and progressive. And I know you're not going to mind that. Not a bit. We encourage it. All right. Excellent. Everybody check out our interview with the Vice President on the YoungTurks.com. Okay. So in that clip, you can hear the discourse of current TV. Progressive, speaking truth to power, independent, without fear or favor. Okay, so this the notion of discourse is very important to how I describe and articulate what current is. And by discourse, I don't mean the Foucauldian sense of a dominating hegemony, and I don't mean the linguistic sense that I'm doing discourse analysis. I mean it in the more sort of popular common sense. That discourse are, it consists of the terms, the tropes, and the styles that are distinct to a particular social universe, okay? So independence. Independence from what? Well, independence means independence from conglomeration, from vertically integrated corporations. And I love this slide here where you have someone playing Al Gore, apparently, saying, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take Fox anymore. So this is Al playing Howard Beale and Patty Chayefsky's genius film from 1976, uh, Network. 
uh, and it's not that far from the truth about how how current uh, articulates itself with the inexpensive handy cam and the right hand and uh, Al Gorezira, the name brand, the name tag there. So like aligning him with um, Al Jazeera. Of course, this is written from someone that's a bit critical of Al, but I, I don't think it's that far from the truth. So not going to watch Fox News anymore. Here's News Corp, the parent company of Fox News, which is the quintessentially conglomerated, vertically integrated corporation. They own film companies, television companies, internet service providers, print, journalism, you name it, radio. So current is not Fox, and that's part of their discourse, is that they, they, they are describing themselves as not Fox, not conglomerated, and not right-wing, the way that Fox is. By not right-wing means that they are progressive. And what is progressivism? Well, progressivism goes all the way back to the 1920s and 1930s and, and the president, our president FDR, who initiated the most progressive uh, legislation that we still have today called the New Deal. And I love this, this uh, cartoon from 1936 from the New York Post in which FDR is riding away with, with some companions that they're supporting, that are representing labor, social security, bank deposit insurance for, for citizens that have money in the banks, relief, neutrality, veterans, farm aid, the TVA, which was the Tennessee Valley Authority, which was a public works project, jobs for the poor, and they're driving away from, what does that represent here in the cartoon, or special privileges, Wall Street, sweatshops, DuPont, like this big chemical organization, um, company unions. So it almost, you know, it's almost like being in an Occupy uh, Wall Street protest here, you know, the kind of language, the discourse, you know, but this was, this is 80, 90 years ago. One of the other issues which is really important for progressivism was, was media reform. And so what you have here is President Hoover listening to one of the early Marconi radio devices. And he gets his ears up to it and he just says, God, it's inconceivable that we should allow so great a possibility for service to be drowned in advertising chatter. That's what President Hoover had to say about radio. You know, what happened to it? You can turn on your radio and find out. <laughs> so the point being is that the subjects of my research are are brute broadcasters, they're television news producers, but they're also media reformers. They want to change the conditions of their production, right, through policy, through technology, and, that, and that's what they intend to do. And they've got some, they've got some history in this process. Here is, uh, here's a slide from a book in, uh, published in 1970 um, by TV, TV, Top Value Television, which was this guerrilla, psychedelic, television news collective, commune really, that was able to get on public access TV that it had just opened up in that period of time. And listen to the language and how it sounds much like what Al Gore says, you know, 30 years later. Only through a radical redesign of the information structure to incorporate two-way decentralized inputs can Media America optimize the feedback it needs to come back to its senses, right? So TV, TV in the 1970s embodying a bit of that progressivism, that media reform ethos. And in fact, they were able to do that as they reported on the Republican and Democratic conventions in their slightly sardonic way in 1972. Another great example is Deep Dish TV, 1980s. Here's their line. TV is being held captive. It is our mission to liberate it. And they were stepping off of President Kennedy's 1961 statement on satellite, which said, Public interest objectives would be given the highest priorities in this new emergent technology called satellite. So groups like Deep Dish TV, TV TV, and Current have attempted to mobilize President Kennedy's claims to fight for anti-monopoly, public interest, free speech, democratic representation, and the public rights to the spectrum of the airwaves. They believe that communication rights are human rights. Okay, so this is the discourse of Current progressive, independent media reform, and it goes all the way to today. Case in point, this slide here, in which uh, the Transportation Workers Union President John Samuelson comes on Current TV's Keith Olbermann show to discuss why he joined the Occupy movement at the peak of, of Occupy's occupation phase. So this is the, the classic merger of, 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 
of archetypal progressive politics, labor, unions, and media reform broadcasters such as Current TV. Okay, so this is the introduction. This is the outline. This is the, the discourse and the practices of this cable tele television network that I've been studying for several years. Here are the research questions. What is culture? What can we learn about culture by studying these people? Culture, that, that, that difficult to define process that we know is everything and around everything and inspiring everything and is part of discourse and practice and how we engage with the world. What is culture? What can we learn about it by looking at these progressive television news uh, re reformers. Secondly, how is culture transforming the public sphere? How is it transforming this space of discourse that is constructed by television news networks? And so, to answer the question of what is culture, I'm going to introduce this, this term called discursive interventions. Okay? Culture, are, culture consists of these discursive moments of intervening within political, economic, power, right? Secondly, how is culture transforming the public sphere? Well, we're going to look at three lenses through which to understand that, and I'm going to explain it in a bit. But first, let's talk a little bit more about culture. Quickly, culture, guerrilla television again, here, Tel TV, TV. Cable television emerges as a new technology, and they're there with policy, with discourse, to gain access into that space and to, and to be able to air their their Republican and Democratic primary coverage with, on cable public television access, right? They they brought together the discursive capacities to do that. Deep Dish TV also 1980s satellite suddenly becomes a commercial capacity. They're there with policy, with politicians, with the technologies, with discursive and practical capacities in order to get onto the satellite systems to be able to air, say, their critical analysis of the, of the first Gulf War. These are examples of culture as a discursive intervention. Secondly, the second major question, how does culture transform the public sphere? We're going to have to look through this, look at this through three different lenses. One is the cycle, the cycle from open to closed, which is a phrase brought out by Tim Wu, and we're, we're going to explore that. Second lens is the broadcasting discourses. And broadcasting has had several different discourses. The public sphere, the guardianship discourse, and the commercial discourse. Thirdly, more broadly, more in the realm of political philosophy, is liberalism. Liberalism is one of the ways we think about how the culture is transforming the public sphere. And liberalism manifests in three different ways. Social liberalism, economic liberalism, and neoliberalism. And remember, at each one of these, the transitions of each of these points is culture. It's a discursive intervention. Here's the first lens, the cycle, Tim Wu. He outlines it in his excellent 2010 book, The Master Switch, The Rise and Fall of Information Empires. Tim Wu is a, was a law professor at Columbia. Now he is working for the FCC. And he outlines a rather simplistic um, teleological analysis of information systems. They move from, and this is the cycle, they move from open, amateur, disruptive, public to closed, professional, private, and commercial manifestations. And that transition is marked by interventions that are legal, political, technical, or, or dialogic. Here's an example of the cycle. Take Edison and the Edison Film Trust in 1906. Edison cre cre invents this kinetophone. He gets together with his friends Kodak and Biograph. Kodak uh, has a monopoly on, on film stock. Biograph is his proto-film company. All of them pool their patents together, and they say, no one can make a film without us. We own all the technology. We've got it all monopolized, right? Films have to be 10 minutes long. There should be no plots, no stars. We want to control and own all of it. Along come some Jewish immigrants, Carl Lamley, Lamley and William Hodkins and uh, Wilhelm Fuchs or w William Fox. Uh, and these are the independents, right? And they say, to hell with the trust. We're going to go to L.A. We're going to go to Hollywood land. And we're going to make films the way we want to make them. We're just going to try it out. And 
the Edison Trust sues them. They sue back on antitrust grounds. They win. And the independents break open the, the Edison Trust. And this is, a, this is an example of the discursive intervention. Legal in this encounter, practical possibly, but they open up film for a space of creativity, innovation, and prosperity, question mark. What do they leave us with? Well, a new closed system called Hollywood. These gates in the slide, though they're kind of open, they're really not. The red carpet is sort of inviting, but it's not really open for amateur public engagement. So the system gets closed again. Okay, Another good example is from the internet. Uh, Tim Wu also coined the term network neutrality to describe the type of internet that these three gentlemen, John Postel, Steve Crocker, and Vince Cerf created, which was a internet that had no priority of this information or that information. They would just spit the bytes down no matter what. The protocols were open and it just worked. You could use sausages, uh, zucchinis, cucumbers, ropes, and, and, and tin cans. It didn't matter. The thing worked. And it didn't prioritize anything. It was, a, it was a quintessentially open system. What we're worried about happening, it really hasn't happened yet, but what we're worried about happening is that the, the idea of network neutrality, that is that, that no information will be tiered or prioritized, will be taken away by the corporatization of, of internet service providing of the, by the internet service providers. And this is a great example, a mock-up of a, of a possible future in which AT&T says, well, you know, for $39.99 you can get CNN.com and ABC and some other little packages, but for $49.99 we'll give you Dig, Flickr, Facebook, iTunes, and so they'll be able to tier the information, class the information. And this is something that some of us don't want to have happen. Uh, we want to keep it open for innovation and for creativity. So this is just another example of Tim Wu's The Cycle. Okay, That's one lens. Here's another lens. Broadcast discourses. And they range from the public sphere to the guardianship to commercial the commercial discourse. Here's the guardianship. Guardianship is a state-driven form of understanding how the media should be, how the media should be managed. And the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, public broadcasting system, uh, British Broadcasting uh, Corporation, these are all great symbols of of the guardianship discourse, right? And the guardianship discourse says that the public needs education, leadership, socialization, and it frames the public as a need of servicing through these media systems. It, you know, wants to generate an enlightened and informed citizen. It's, it's, it's the audience is a public, right? A public that is a citizenship public. Ian Ong calls it, Audience as public consists not of consumers, but of citizens who must be reformed, educated, informed, as well as entertained and short-served, presumably to enable them to better perform their democratic rights and duties. And this Big Bird, of course, is part of the PBS network. We're going to get back to uh, Big Bird in a second. So that's the guardianship, that the, that the state is guarding over this resource, and we're going to allocate it and inform the public. The second broadcast discourse is the commercial discourse. We're quite familiar with this one. Aang con contrasts this audience as public discourse of the guardianship discourse with audiences as markets, which envisions audiences not as self-governing publics, but as consumers. The marker for success is not an informed populace, but a profitable company. This is the instrumental view, which privileges the concept of consumer over citizen. This model sees that broadcasters as community trustees should be replaced by a view of broadcasters as marketplace participants. The first step in a marketplace approach to broadcast regulation, then, is to focus on broadcasters not as fiduciaries of the public, but as marketplace competitors. Great examples are MSNBC, Fox News, CNN, you know, these are for-profit driven corporations that happen to also provide some news information about current events. Oddly enough, or perhaps not, the FCC 
the Federal Communications Commission articulates its mission in this commercial discourse. A, a report says that overwhelmingly tied, the FCC is overwhelmingly tied to such market-oriented concepts as maximizing competition, enhancing market power, promoting investment and incentives, ensuring competitive rate structures, removing barriers to entry, and encouraging new service providers. And that's basically what my research is revealing that they do, except for one guy, this guy right here, um, two to the, from the left, the old gentleman there, Michael Copps, who has often been a champion of the third discourse, the public sphere discourse, which is best represented by the Pacifica Radio Network, which we listen to in, in LA as KPFK 90.7, and New York as WBAI, and uh, the Independent Media Center, the IMC, is a great example of the public sphere in practice of internet-based uh, citizen media producers. And the public sphere discourse frames the public as co-participants in the production of media and co-owners of the media resource. An example is Pacifica Radio, like I said. Pacifica, unlike the guardianship discourse as represented in National Public Radio or the PBS, is not just listener-supported, but listener-directed. Pacifica has local community boards, community programming, and a national board consisting of producers and listeners. So this public sphere discourse to broadcasting is characterized by participatory culture, citizen journalism, dialogue amongst communities or social movements, democratic decision-making, and social ownership of the means of media production and distribution. Okay, so these are the three different broadcast discourses we have. And in Philadelphia, for instance, you this is how they might stack up. You've got the public sphere discourse being represented by WBAI coming in from New York. You've got your guardianship discourse coming from your PBS affiliate, WHYY. And you've got your commercial discourse coming in from Philadelphia 10, which is the NBC affiliate. Okay, So the third lens through which we can understand how culture intervenes within the public sphere is liberalism. Okay, This grand classical political philosophy. And liberalism in four words would be about liberty in the individual. And it's got some, some iterations, you know, some subsections. One of them is social liberalism, which says that Liberty comes from a state support of social justice. So social liber liberalism provides liberty to individuals through the state. And that is through supporting social justice programs. And this is connected with classical modes of progressivism that we talked about going back to the New Deal and FDR. In Isaiah Berlin's phrase, this is positive freedom. It is the power to fulfill one's destiny, and sometimes this requires some state intervention. The second modality of liberalism is economic liberalism, which seeks to provide liberty to the individual through state support of economic freedom. Okay, And this is coming out of uh, Hayek and Austrian economics, and it's the idea that the state should support capitalism. And yet the state exists and it intervenes in antitrust issue. It, it puts investment into science, recovery, development, and it gives some concessions to the public interest, such as the public interest set aside we saw in cable and satellite broadcasting at TV, TV, and, and Deep Dish. And in Isaiah Berlin's terms, this would be negative freedom, which is free from constraint. The third one is neoliberalism, the most present one, which is we provide liberty to the individual through no state at all. It's all market. This is gloves off capitalism. If economic liberalism was was represented or symbolized by Adam Smith's invisible hand, this is capitalism with the gloves off. Okay, so this is the third lens through which we can see how to understand how culture intervenes within the public sphere generated around Television news. Quick review. Three lenses. The cycle. From open to close. Broadcasting discourses. And finally, liberalism.
So let's bring this down to our case study, current TV. So I'm going to first provide an example of the discursive intervention that, that initiated current TV. Here's David Newman, president of programming. He says a profane word. I hope that's okay. During my service in the United States of Congress, uh, I took the initiative in creating the Internet. We were out to create a news and information network right. that would be partly, if not mostly, supplied by the audience themselves. Right. So a new, free, and open, mm -hmm. democratic, you know, and that the selection of the stories would be democratized, mm -hmm. and the sourcing of the stories would be democratized, and... And the and the content of the stories would reflect, you know, open thinking that wasn't available elsewhere. Is the democratization of television motif coming out of a, a activistic space, a political space, or kind of it a was coming out economic of very, space? You no, know, I think it was coming out. Of, I think it was coming out of a very specific space for Al. Yeah. I think that Al looked at what had happened mm -hmm. in two thousand. And he said, part of the reason for this clusterfuck is the vertical integration of media power mm -hmm. and the suppression of the democratic dialogue. Mm -hmm. You know, that in the days of Thomas Paine and Patrick Henry, there was a vibrant debate in every tavern and every town square. And where was that debate? on television, nowhere, because no one wanted to have it, because, you know, I mean, because because it wasn't in the business interests of the vertically integrated corporations to facilitate it, right? right? So I think he really had a very idealistic notion that this was essential for democracy to bust open this monopoly. And I thought that that was not only true, but I also thought it was true that, you know, the world could use another news and information brand, too. Okay. So, David Newman, president of program for Current TV, you can hear that interventionary discourse emerging. This discourse that empowers uh, the employees of Current TV, that, that energizes their value set. You hear it in his language, free, open, democratic, open thinking. Resistance to the vertically integrated media companies that, uh, that, that, that was suppressing the democratic dialogue. It's extraordinarily Habermasian. It's even de Tocquevian, meaning it's very Amer it's critique of America, really. The notion that in the days of uh, Thomas Henry, you know, Patrick Henry, and Thomas Paine, the public sphere was a town square and tavern, and that Al and David and they wanted to fix that. So how did they? With this site. That was their idea. So let's take a look at this site a little bit. This is VC squared. This is viewer created content idea. User generated content produced by the community, representing the values of the community that they're going to bring to TV. And we're all going to discuss it online, on TV, and beyond. So let's take a quick look at this website. As you can see, the front page is all about user generated content. All of these videos are produced by by citizen journalists. The top of the thing is all about watch and vote. Make a video and make the ads, community, blog, right? The TV network is almost an afterthought in some degree. You've got a blog down here written by uh, by one of the citizen contributors. Down here you've got the the leaderboard, which is where we voted once a week. They would buy for a thousand dollars the the pod, the short documentary that that got the most votes. And they would buy it and they'd just put it into the loop. So this was their intervention. This was the practical intervention that, that, that they had in order to improve the uh, democratic dialogue in the public sphere. Okay? Uh, another example of the public sphere is, can be represented in this... As the war in Iraq rages on, one of the stories you might not be hearing as much about are the Iraqi refugees. The UN estimates that approximately 4 million Iraqis are displaced all around the world. This is a story that we've been following pretty closely in CJ. We've seen stories from Kurdistan, Jordan, Syria, and even as far away as Sweden. 
So recently, frequent uploader Adam Fish, who goes by the username Robert, uploaded a story about Iraqi refugees in an entirely different location, the island of Cyprus. So I'm in Nicosia, Cyprus, going to go see these Iraqi refugees that seem to be camping out in these shanty towns in the green zone, uh, right on the border of the UN headquarters here in Cyprus. And we're going to try to find out uh, why they're seeking asylum in Cyprus. These guys are in a really interesting position to talk about what's happening in Iraq. All the guys featured in the pod are secular, and so they've been targeted by radical Islamist extremists who believe that their form of religion should be the religion that rules the nation of Iraq. We are secular. So all, the, all my country now under the control of religions, religions men. We can't live with them. So interestingly, after Adam uploaded his pod, a few of the individuals featured in the pod from Cyprus were able to see it on the site. I'm here with Jawad, a musician, a mayor, a professor and laser technician, Shai, a guard, Cahill, a military man. Jawad thanked Adam and the others commenting on the pod, saying, I want to say thank you very much for your concern about us because we spent six months suffering. The men you see in the piece are seeking asylum from the government of Cyprus. Another man in the pod, Amar, commented saying, Unfortunately, we discovered that we managed to escape death only to be detained in Cyprus. In other words, we have not been granted refugee status nor allowed to leave the country to other places where we can get our full rights as refugees. Many other people on the site have commented on the pod and how they can get involved and help these men out. You should log on to Current.TV, check out the pod, it's called Secular Iraqi Refugees, leave a comment, get involved in the conversation. So an example of the public sphere discourse, right? I'm out there, a citizen journalist, documenting this, the plight of these, these Iraqi refugees. Andrew's in, 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 at Current TV headquarters in San Francisco, articulating and, and aggregating the information I'm bringing him. Jawad Namar, or finding an internet cafe in Cyprus and, and commenting. Other people are, are commenting and other viewers are participating and, and viewing in this is veritable media ecology that includes TV, the internet, social news. It is a great example of, of the utopian capacities of participatory culture, right? It is. And it was, it was great to be a part of that, that phase. So let's go back over the VC square phase and think about the three lenses that we're talking about and how they are represented, right? So the cycle. At the beginning of VC square, this was the era of convergence, a real disruptive moment. It's 2005. It's the era of in, uh, the emergence, the pioneering phase of internet video. It's this moment of incredible openness. YouTube had just found, been founded just six months earlier than, than current TV. So it's that really disruptive moment that Tim Wu talks about. Uh, that's extraordinarily open. Um, there's, it, as far as the discourse is concerned at VC Square, it's public sphere, as you can tell in the previous video. It's also commercial, right? It's public sphere in so far that we felt like it was our network. We were in dialogue with the producers. We were making content. It was also commercial because, in a way, the whole thing was propped up by angel investors hoping to ride a wave of, pro of prosperity on the backs of the Web 2.0 bubble. I mean, that's really what was also occurring. And we also didn't own stock in the network. So, again, a multiplicity of possibilities. Liberalism, the liberalism lens in this VC squared phase, well, there was two manifestations, so social and economic. The VC squared phase um, represented social liberalism in so fact that it was trying to respond to a public need for improved dialogue for democracy. Uh, it also represented the economic liberalism because it was the it was a corporation actually doing the work of the state. It was a corporation trying to provide some of the some of the services that supports democracy. So it's kind of a corporate economic liberalism. Finally, it's also neoliberalism because Citizen journalism, citizen journalism that drove me to go work with these Iraqi refugees can be considered a type of outsourcing, almost exploitative. You know, what is kind of called crowdsourcing, you know, to little or unpaid producers. And that could possibly be seen as a form of digital labor, almost a type of sweatshop labor in a way, because we weren't getting paid that much. And most of them weren't getting paid at all. So, 
that's how a number of those lenses played out in this phase of, of BC square. Okay, so the next phase is current.com, right? The social news phase from 2007 to 2009. Let's look at some of the interventionary discourses that play out in this phase. In fact, let's actually hear Vice President Justin Gunn. Really the exciting thing about Current.com and what we're doing is connecting the two platforms of television and the internet. So you could be watching television, Current TV, and have your laptop open. And we have some very interesting uh, research that shows that about 70% of our audience actually watches our network with a broadband connected computer open and on. So th this is a multitasking generation and they're moving from screen to screen. So it makes perfect sense to give them ways to do something on one screen and have it be affected on the other or see something of interest on the television screen and then go to their computer and have more context and be able to engage in conversation and then indeed to have that contribution and that participation in the form of that conversation be reflected back up again on television. So it really is a virtuous circle of participation. All right. So Justin Gunn, Vice President, Current TV, you can hear him talk about trying to capitalize on it, right? And yet it's also couched in the terms of social liberalism, I meaning it's a virtuous circle of participation. So Current.com was their social media project. After VC Square from 2005 to 2007, 2007 2009 is made manifest by the social news phase. Let's take a look at this website. You can see the VC Square project has been allocated to this little right-hand corner over here. Um, and the rest of it is all about implicit participation. Up here in the upper left, come and explore or connect to people who share your interests. So it's trying to do a little social, social media thing where Facebook is starting to really blow up, 2007, 2008. Contribute. But we're not talking about contribute video. A little too hard. We're trying to lower the bar a little bit. Contribute just some links to news stories you, you think are cool. Okay, so the whole th the whole front page has been revamped to to encourage people to do not explicit forms of participation, but implicit forms of participation. So how does this fit within our lenses? So the cycle. Remember, this is the social news phase. Remember, the, and it's not so disruptive anymore. Others have already won the Silicon Valley sweepstakes, as far as social news is concerned. Dig. YouTube, different sites are, are already sort of pioneering in that space. So they're kind of a second string on this already. So that's that. The discourse within the, within the social news phase is it's still public sphere, as I said, but it's moved from explicit to implicit. And it also has a certain amount of commercial paranoia, meaning the 2008 global financial crisis pressure has been mounting and current needs to find a solution to start really bringing in revenues. The angel investors and the Hollywood moguls are trying to find a, a, a return on their investment during this period of time. Finally, liberalism. This reduced social liberalism, more a way to capitalize, capitalize, that is really commercialize the implicit user-generated content that was coming to their site. And in, in this, in insofar that this was their project, this was increasing signs of neoliberalism, meaning how can we monetize this free content we're getting? Much less concerned with social justice and more on the market. So the third, the third and final phase thus far is the Hollywood phase, where Current says, all right, to hell with the public sphere project. We're going to go classic cable television news punditry. We're going to hire Keith Olbermann from MSNBC, Jenk Uger, who is a radical progressive, and this is what Habermas might call the, refut the refutalization of the public sphere. In this phase, the cycle is now closed. Current looks like any other news network. The discourse, well, we see the end of the public sphere discourse in this phase. Current no longer accepts submissions of any type, really. I mean, they kind of still keep the social news alive, but it's so back burner, you can't really tell. You can see it on the website. There's really nothing there. It's all about our shows. Here's Jank. Here's Keith. It's just about their shows, which is fine. <laughs> so Current no longer accepts submissions, and this is the rise of the guardianship discourse, right? 
with talking heads telling us what we should think as opposed to the public sphere users collectively discursively describing what to think. And finally, liberalism in this phase. You can see the rejection of social liberalism in the face of the financial crisis and the embrace of economic liberalism. But strangely enough, and this is, this is a problem I haven't quite figured out yet, is that you see a performed rejection of neoliberalism as Olbermann and Jenk attack it and support wholeheartedly the Occupy Wall Street movement and the budget repair bill protests in Wisconsin. Well, all the while, cutting a quarter of their sa staff and downsizing, which are rather neoliberal stunts. Okay, so that's what happens in that phase. So what is the conclusion to all of this? Well, there's a lot of hybridity. There's a lot of non-linearity. There's a lot of adaptability. There's a lot of simultaneity. And of course, a ton of contradiction. Meaning, the modalities of current TV can mix in open style with a guardianship discourse and yet still be neoliberal. It can be closed, but exhibit some forms of public sphere discourse while also being deeply embedded within economic or, or corporate liberalism, meaning it's flexible, adaptable, hybrid, and essentially full of deep contradictions. Right? So flexibility, flexibility, Reminds me of the phrase flexible capitalism, which is what well, which is how we describe globalization today. Right? And yet this flexibility, this flexibility to offshore, onshore, outsource, crowdsource, develop different platforms is it has extreme and serious impact on human beings, employed human beings. As the great sociologist Richard Sennett says, workers can expect in the information industries to change jobs at least 11 times in the course of working and change his or her skill base at least three times during those 40 years. Instead of careers, employers are given projects and their employment may last only until the project is complete. So with each transition current made came a lot of job cuts. So... That's the reality of, of this flexibility, right? It shows a lot of adaptability, a lot of hybridity, simultaneity, contradiction, but a lot of flexibility with very human implications. So what is the dominant discourse today? And what, which of these political philosophical notions or discourses is dominating? Let's take a look at a video of a presumed Republican nominee, Mitt Romney, in Homer's Deli in Iowa, January 2nd, 2012, just a week or two ago. Well, my test is, is a program so critical that it's worth borrowing money from China to pay for it? Yeah. And, and the answer, I, so on that, I guess say some, so some things that you might like, you might say, I like the National Endowment for the Arts. I do. I like PBS. We subsidize PBS. Look, I'm, not, I'm going to stop that. I'm going to say PBS is going to have to have advertisement. We're not going to kill Big Bird, but Big Bird's going to have advertisements, all right? Mitt Romney say, revealing how the guardianship discourse of PBS is meeting the commercial discourse. And within, in, within his utopia, the commercial discourse would triumph and the market fundamentalism would, would win out. And so this is how Mint would like Big Bird to look. With Bain Capital on it, his own Bain Capital on the right shoulder, and Walmart, Bank of America, BP, ConAgra, McDonald's really being stamped all around Big Bird. And so this is the dominant logic of the day, and this is essentially neoliberalism. And... I'm okay with that, I guess. <laughs> Just kidding. I'm not okay with that. I think that finances, I think we're a rich nation and finances should go and could go to some public financing of, of media and the media should be used for the public good. However, if that's how Big Bird's going to look, then this is how I think Mitt Romney and his 
political buddies like Barack Obama should look with stamped in this coat of arms like they're a NASCAR racer with Google and Citigroup and Goldman Sachs and Harvard and MoveOn.org, MoveOn.org and Microsoft stamped all along. So they also need to reveal their advertising sponsors. And this process towards neoliberalism in the media systems is not isolated to America. It's, of course, also within the UK because, as we know, Reagan and Thatcher uh, collaborated to institutionalize Milton Friedman and you know, Austrian economics in creating the neoliberal manifestations we have today. And so this slide illustrates how the BBC is now going to run ads for the first time in the history of their century-old pro, uh, social project. And this is just from January 5, which was only a few days ago. So they're going to run ads. And, that, and so what we, we, we again see is, is the meeting between the guardianship, that is the state-driven media, with the commercial imperative, the commercial discourse, or the neoliberal discourse, um, that the state cannot afford to, to do anything of service as far as the media is concerned for the public. So, with that, let's end on a um, slightly less positive note. News of the world. News course, you know, gossipy rag that was caught in phone hacking scandals fails, gets cut off from the, from the octopus of, of the conglomerate uh, News Corps. And so the giants can fall. Um, I'd prefer to see media reform organizations uh, moderate, regulate, and reform these organizations as opposed to them just being caught in salacious and terrible uh, invasions of human privacy. But the cycle continues as we've said, with, with its ebbs and troughs. And so News of the World went down, and News Corps lost a great source of, of income, but the work continues. So as the News of the World said thank you, I too will say thank you.